Hello everyone, I'm Lawrence. This is the Pentax K1. Pentax finally made a full frame DSLR. As always on this channel, we'll start with a physical overview. Pentax K1 is basically what happens when someone asks, what features shall we put in? And an overly ambitious Pentax engineer says, all the features. So because of that, we have an awful lot to cover here with the Pentax K1. I'm going to start with the ergonomics. Now this camera weighs a whopping one kilogram. It's a full metal body, but basically the really nice grip and the position of the buttons and dials, which are all basically exactly where you need them, really make up for that. And so I really like the handling of the K1. It's nicely balanced. As I said, this is Pentax's first full frame DSLR. It packs a 36.4 megapixel sensor. That sensor is stabilized with the new 5-axis shake reduction system SR2. There is no anti-aliasing filter present, but you can simulate it by using the fancy SR2 system. Another fancy feature is the sensor cleaning by shaking the sensor around at ultrasonic speeds. Furthermore, the SR2 can do something called pixel shift. It moves the sensor around one full pixel for four shots in a row in order to have much higher color detail. This feature is somewhat similar to HDR, but instead of taking pictures at three different exposures, you're taking pictures with four different sensor locations and combining all the color information from those four pictures. It also means you don't have the weird looking HDR colors, and what you get instead is not a sharper picture, not a high resolution picture, but just a lot more micro contrast and a lot more detail in your colors. So this feature is great when you're doing landscape, but also when you're doing portraits, because with the update that I'm using, we're using version 1.10 here with our testing, you can also use it on moving subjects. So let's talk a little bit about buttons and dials, and there are plenty on the K1. Most of them are configurable yourself as well. So we'll start on the left. You have your autofocus and manual focus switch here. There is a button to select your autofocus mode, as well as an autofocus lock button up here. And then there's your first customizable button, which standard just takes a raw file of the next image if you're using it as just a JPEG camera. So that's a really nice feature. Moving towards the top, still on the left side, is the mode dial. There are nine different modes on here, as well as five user programmable modes. Again, really nice. Now, I really like um, that there's a lock on there, but you don't really have to use it. The, the dial uses just the right force to turn it, so you won't turn it by accident, but it's also not too difficult to turn it when you really want to. Moving to the right top side is where you have this front dial, which you can set to aperture or shutter speed. Um, and then there's, of course, the on and off button, which also has a digital preview mode, which is really handy because it takes the picture, but it doesn't save it. So you just have a quick preview of what you're going to shoot without actually having to shoot it. Quite a handy feature, actually. Uh, there is a white balance button as well as an ISO button, but the main star of the top here is this menu dial. It's basically a dial to replace the menu system. Uh, and so you set it to what you want to change, and then you have the other back dial, which you then use to change that with. So this is a really handy dial because now you can use this back dial for many different features without having to go into the menu system. So you can set it to ISO exposure compensation, you can set it to crop the image, you can use it to turn the Wi-Fi on or off. Now that's all really nice, but you can't see what you're changing when looking through the, the viewfinder, the optical viewfinder. So maybe there should be like a small LCD inside there as well to let you know what mode you're in. And below this dial, there is the switch to go into video mode, but more about video mode in a bit. By far, my favorite button on the top of this camera is the light button. And if you press this button, it illuminates not just the lens mount, but also the back buttons. Uh, and there are LEDs behind the LCD display, so it lights up the back of your camera real nice. Because this lighting brings us to another feature, the astro tracer so basically you mount it on a tripod and it will trace the stars so you don't get star trails but if you're doing that at night and you want to swap lenses that's where the leds are for so you can you know see where the mounts are where the red dot is to mount your lens also to see where the back buttons are really really handy feature now moving on to the back more buttons um, first off the dial again you can set this to aperture or shutter speed depending on what you prefer uh, but you also use it to zoom in and out when you're viewing your pictures that you took on the left side is the live view button as well as the metering mode really good metering on this one you can basically set it to do whatever type of metering you want to uh, then on the right we have back button autofocus really nice and also another autofocus lock button Talking about the autofocus, I would have preferred a joystick to move it around or a touchscreen, which 
we have neither of those two. Uh, instead, we get a D-pad. And if you want to move from the auto 33 point autofocus mode to single point, you actually have to go through the menus to then set that point with the D-pad. But if you want to change another setting, you have to get out of that menu again. It's a bit fiddly. I wish it was like at least incorporated in this top mode dial, but it isn't. So needs a bit of a software update to fix that. So now that we're finally done with our button overview, time to move to IO. So on the top here, you have a little cover for a cable release. Uh, and then there is an audio jack. So for your headphones, a microphone jack, if you want to use an external microphone, there is a stereo microphone built in. Not sure if you want to use that though. Uh, on the left, we have USB 2.0, a little bit of a rant coming in a second, uh, and a mini HDMI as well as a DC in 8.3 volt. Now, I said I was going to go on a little bit of a rant about the USB, and you see the K3 and the 645 cameras, they all have USB 3.0. This one, simply 2.0, and even worse, the 2.0 only gives you speeds up to 15 megabytes a second, which is not even the theoretical 50 megabytes a second that USB 2.0 could give you. So it's absolutely rubbish, the USB port. You can't charge over USB either, which you can do on something like a Sony A7. So I don't at all like this. If you're in the field, you just have your camera, your laptop and a USB cable with you, um, you won't be able to offload data from your SD card to an external hard drive, to your laptop, to the cloud, whatever you want to use. So Pentax should really have made that possible. On the other side is room for dual SD cards. I used 150 megabyte second SD cards and you still fill those up really quickly. Um, so you really wanna make sure you have two giant cards in here if you're going for a full day of shooting. Below the SD card door, that's where your remote is. Now the battery door, really nice system. It's an 1860 milliamp hour battery. Should last you around 760 shots according to Pentex. I can say that's fairly accurate, but if you want more, there is a sealed door here on the bottom for battery grips. So with that out of the way, finally time to talk about the viewfinder. 100% accuracy, 0.7 times magnification at f1.4. Really good viewfinder, very customizable. You can get all the grids on there. You can get the brackets on there. On the back, you get a 1 million dot LCD display. Very good display. I like how big it is. I don't like that it's not a touch screen, as I said earlier, um, but it's there. It's really color accurate and you can make it go really bright with an overly bright mode for those outdoor situations. But I don't have any complaints about this display at all uh, when it comes to brightness or color accuracy. And if you have some complaints, you can easily, easily calibrate it yourself. On the top, there's also another LCD display to look at your exposure settings real quick. Being a Pentax, the menu system is very nice and easy to navigate with plenty of customizability to a point where you can set the font size and even the color of the highlights. Uh, you can easily calibrate basically whatever you want. You can mess around with a bunch of settings that I personally never even heard of. So with all that out of the way, I can finally talk about image quality. And the image quality is just amazing, really. This 36 megapixel camera without an anti-aliasing filter. Incredibly sharp, incredibly accurate. I love the Pentax processing with colors in the JPEGs and the rolls are very awesome too. Again, more about that later. Now, at the moment, in terms of lenses, all the lenses are rather old. You can still use them on this body. Uh, you can also use the 645 lenses with a little bit of an adapter going on. But Pentax is making a lot of new lenses and apparently they're really good. Now, the PR people that I work with only had one lens available for me. So this is the 28 to 70 uh, f3.5 to f5.6. To test the dynamic range of this 36 megapixel sensor, I went to an abandoned train station and took some pictures at noon with the sun beating down on me and on the rusty trains. And the dynamic range is very good. Even in these horrible conditions, I was able to keep some detail in the sky while not having the shadows blacked out completely. You can really push the raw files a lot further than the camera JPEGs, even though those JPEGs do look really good. Now about the raw support, Pentax actually lets you choose between two different file formats, you can shoot DNG files and PEF files. Now the PEF files you have to open with the Silky Pix software in order to do anything with them. With the DNG files though, you can just upload it into whatever software you use and a lot of software actually supports DNG without updating it at all. So that's really great with the K1 that Choose, that you can just choose what raw format you're shooting. You can of course also shoot JPEGs with this in three different quality settings. Now these DNG files are 14-bit. Um, they're really, really good. You can do an awful lot with them. You can boost shadows like 
crazy really. Um, the highlight's not that good, so I would maybe shoot slightly underexposed if I want to bring back, uh, or bring up the shadows and bring back the highlights a little bit. But overall, the detail in the raw files, extraordinarily good. As these ISO images go over your screen, you can see how everything up to ISO 6400 is really great looking and 12800 is still usable for some publications after doing some post-processing. Now, as you can see in the images right now, this camera does have HDR and the pixel shift technology, and both of them work handheld thanks to the shake reduction, as long as, of course, the subject isn't moving. So the way HDR works kind of depends on how you set it up. You can set what the lowest minus EV and the highest plus EV will be, um, and then it just takes three pictures, combines it all into one HDR picture with quite weird looking colors, as always, with HDR pictures. I much prefer the pixel shift technology because it takes four pictures at the same exposure setting, but what it does is it moves the sensor up one to the right one, down one to the left one, and this gives you basically four times as much color accuracy within one pixel, uh, and that just creates a whole lot more micro contrast and way nicer colors without actually upping the resolution like you would get with an Olympus camera or with some smartphones that do this. And actually, I cannot say enough nice things about the shake reduction system. I can handheld shoot pictures at one tenth of a second shutter time, which for me is insane because I shake very, very badly. I know a lot of people with the K1 will be able to shoot at one fifth of a second just hand holding it. And so this brings me to the video. And basically Pentax put a microphone jack on there, a headphone jack, uh, the dedicated video mode. It's like Pentax was like, yeah, let's make this a good video camera. And then they decided to just no longer bother with it. Uh, the video isn't very good. It's not very sharp. There's not a lot of color in there. The shake reduction doesn't work very well with video. They just didn't even try in my opinion. And that's a real shame. You see the K1, great stills camera, but as a journalist, going to take your K1 with you to shoot all your stills that you're going to upload to get in the papers and stuff. And then you might want to shoot a blog video for yourself or just like a video diary. And you can't because the camera video quality is pretty rubbish. So you have to carry a second body with you with a second pair of lenses, uh, which won't be made by Pentax. So from Pentax's point of view, I have no idea why they don't try harder on video quality. So all of this brings us to our autofocus testing. There are 33 autofocus points, 25 of them are cross-type. They're all in a rectangular shape in the center of the frame. So if you want to focus on those extremities of your frame, you're out of luck with this K1. Uh, for everyone else, it's actually quite good. You have different modes. You have single point mode, uh, custom shapes, all that sort of stuff, really handy to set up. Uh, I miss some features like the tracking or the face or eye detect stuff. I really hope they'll add that in a uh, future firmware update because it's really handy when doing portraits. Now, I had the luck of having my cousin ride his little bike through skate park so I could do those tracking autofocus shots. And while a lot of other reviewers said that it's not that good, maybe it's because I'm on version 1.10, I don't know, but it actually worked really well for tracking him. Um, most pictures were in focus. I did notice that when the subject is backlit and a bit too dark, uh, it doesn't focus on the foreground. It actually tries to focus on the background instead, which isn't quite that good. But for most situations, the pictures were very sharp, basically bang on. The autofocus was very, very quick and very accurate. No hunting around or any of that nonsense. I do have some complaints about the autofocus when shooting continuous, and that's basically not the fault of the autofocus at all. It's all the fault of the amount of frames per second you can shoot in burst mode and the size of the buffer. The buffer is way too small. It would fill up after 50 pictures. So all of this brings me to the question, who should buy the K1? I think it's great for portraits, it's great for landscapes, everything where you don't need that fast burst because the autofocus is great, but you don't have the burst, nor do you have the buffer size to really do action-packed shots. So all that brings us to a conclusion, and basically that conclusion is the K1, an amazing camera, but it doesn't have any decent video, and the user base is very small. So if you're an existing Pentax user, if you're maybe still shooting analog Pentax stuff, you have all those lenses, or if you're a new pro photographer or your first full frame camera, it's actually a great idea to buy one of these. It is more expensive than the Sony full frame stuff, um, more expensive than some of the Nikon full frame stuff, but it is for what you pay for it, really an amazing camera body uh, with really good autofocus, really, really sharp images and a bunch of features. 
So guys, if you like my review of the Pentax K1, feel free to press that like button. If you didn't, that's fine too. There's a subscribe button for when I make a video you do like. Uh, and you can of course comment if you have any questions or requests for a future review. Please put all those below this video in the comment area. If all of that is not enough for you, you can of course follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and if you want to, you can support the channel on Patreon or PayPal. For now though, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.